We are back with our closing keynote, and uh, I've got a I've got a new T-shirt, and uh, we've got two amazing guests. So let me start by introducing our guests because I, I I got this T-shirt with them in mind. First of all, we have the co-founder of Ethereum, Joe Lubin, who is joining us, uh, as well as John Wolpert, who is a group executive focused on baseline and public blockchain technology. And we are really going to talk today about public blockchains and the enormous effort, investment, and transformation that's going on. Now, uh, uh, Joe and John, I, I, we had this t-shirt made, and I, I especially want to present it for, for you guys, and we'll see if we can get you a copy. But it's, it's, very, it's a sort of a pandemic-themed blockchain t-shirt, which I hope you'll love. I'm going to turn around on the back so you can see it. It's 2020, and the only thing you should have out in public is your blockchain. So I hope you guys love that. And, uh, you know, before I, I get started, uh, before we get started, I just want to give you guys a chance to talk a little bit about the amazing collaboration that EY and Consensus had uh, getting started last year uh, be between us, right? You, uh, John, you, you kind of broke the ice at, um, I think it was the DevCon in Osaka. And we really started talking about how we should be working together to drive the mainnet forward. And that was the beginning of an incredibly fruitful uh, and very intense working period. And so, John, maybe just tell us the story about this and how we got started. Well, Paul, it's, it's really great to see. This is almost a year later. Um, I remember it was Travis who, uh, uh, at the last minute, put you and I on stage um, uh, at, at Ethereal. And I got to do something that I, 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 I want to do more of, which is just uh, interview you. Um, so I got to be the questioner, you got to be the answerer, and that was fun for me because um, you're funnier, smarter, and better looking. So it was, it was, you know, it was, it was good to be to play the the, the Bob better, Newhart better role. dressed as well, and better dressed. Oh, thank you. Uh, well, flattery will get you guys anything. <laughs> so that was a lot of fun, and then yeah, you called up a, a few weeks later, and you're, you know, you're like, let's do something, boom, and and we were off. So um, it's been delightful ever since. You're right. I think it was, it was the Ethereal Summit. And then things really started to accelerate as we got towards uh, DevCon and Osaka, right? Um, uh, Joe, uh, talk to me a little bit about what you see as uh, where baseline and the future of Ethereum and consensus intersect together. Because as the co-founder of Ethereum and as the leader of consensus, you know, I, I, of all the people in the world, I think of you as a person with the big picture vision on this. Sure. So we, um, since really the start of Ethereum, uh, we thought that there would be convergence. Uh, we, we expected that uh, uh, we would do some really interesting things um, in this crazy public permissionless context and we'd have to build out the technology in the most Byzantine of environments, uh, but uh, that unless we drew in uh, you know, all actors from all walks of life, all pursuits, on planet Earth that uh, ultimately we, we will not have uh, succeeded in um, essentially bringing decentralized protocols uh, forward, uh, building a more decentralized web and more decentralized global information technology infrastructure. Um, and so early on at Consensus, uh, we focused on uh, the public mainnet blockchain, uh, we intended to build applications. We ended up uh, having to build lots of the infrastructure for the ecosystem, developer tooling, et cetera. Um, and we um, got calls from lots of organizations, from central banks to um, companies and, and uh, um, who knows. Uh, and we ended up uh, doing as much as we could to educate, to foster adoption. Uh, we ended up doing a little bit of advisory work, which led to people asking us to build software. And so uh, very early on at Consensus, it was uh, very tangible uh, that we were working towards convergence, uh, bringing um, the uh, sort of button down uh, business ecosystem that needed uh, privacy, confidentiality, um, security, usability, um, towards the Ethereum technology. Um, and we built all of that in the private permission context. And now 
pretty much all of that is available thanks to, to you and others uh, in the public permission context. And that's always been the goal uh, to bring everybody into uh, the public permissionless context. Uh, you can build private permission systems on the public permissionless network. Uh, as you indicated earlier today, that's roughly what people do on the public permissionless internet. Um, and so we're, we're looking forward to uh, all working together on a decentralized web with lots of different interoperating protocols, uh, uh, Ethereum and others for uh, certain kinds of activities, but decentralized storage, decentralized bandwidth, decentralized heavy compute, decentralized proof of location, decentralized identity, et cetera. So obviously just in mountainous things, right? How important is the network effect in getting all of these uh, uh, to work together? Is it just about making the services available or does it matter you know, which companies are there and how they interact with each other? And how do we, how do we kickstart this ecosystem? Sean, do you want that one? Well, I, I think um, you have to take people from where they're at. I remember Mary uh, in, in the previous panel said uh, something, you know, she said, you know, EY is so innovative and so forward thinking that, um, that you know, how do we follow? Because we're all boring here, and uh, I think you know, the implication was, uh, you know, us boring people that are doing day-to-day -day stuff, uh, you know, aren't, aren't going to be able to keep up. And and I, I thought to myself, well, wow, um, to say a, a, a over hundred-year-old accounting company that they're forward-thinking and and innovative is pretty interesting. And but then you know, really, that's what baselining is all about: is is being able to say. Um, you know, there's, there's lots of exciting uses of blockchain, but let's think of the most boring one that your CISOs aren't going to lose their minds over thinking about contemplating using. So, you know, can we find a way to use the public blockchain um, in such a way that um, you aren't exposing data that you're not giving away strategic intelligence to your competitors or to somebody with a good AI? They can't develop classifiers on your uh, activities or your relationships. And if you can do that, why not use the mainnet, right? It's always on. You get to pay as you go. You don't have to uh, involve capital expense. It's, it's running for its own reasons and you can't lock you out and it resists tampering. So if you can do it for the boring stuff, you can do the exciting stuff later. So blockchain is collaboration network technology. I don't know how you turn off the network effect uh, for blockchain. Um, I've heard you say that for every organization that agrees to join somebody else's blockchain private private blockchain system that there, there are two others that want to start their own private system and um, uh, effectively um, the reason to build a blockchain system is to collaborate more fluidly more effectively more transparently uh, and now more privately uh, with many organizations in your value chain or in your ecosystem uh, we will uh, see a great big magnet uh, as more and more organizations uh, migrate their activity to the place where everybody else is. Right now, um, most organizations and their sort of uh, the forward thinking DeFi and gaming and, and other organizations and, and some doing a little bit more conventional business, uh, um, pretty much the bulk of them are choosing Ethereum. So, uh that's always encouraging to hear and it makes me happy when I see that and we picked Ethereum because it is by far the largest ecosystem. John, I would love for you to just talk to us a little bit about some of the logic behind one of the nicest and, and cleverest innovations in, um, in baseline, which is uh, the concept of the blockchain as a messaging bus. Right. This is something that you kind of came up with and you made sure got inserted into there. Talk to us because of your history at IBM and, and your history in helping create Hyperledger. Why, why are message buses so important in a way that's not yet covered by traditional tokenization? And please use the technical diagram behind you. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, that's my, my magic bus above there. Um, yeah, exactly. Yes. Uh, so, I mean, we, we, were say, we were calling this the magic bus um, back before we could say baseline because we hadn't, um, for a while, we hadn't come up with that word. And then, um, boy, that, that turned out to be the right word. Um, people really like it. And, and it's, it's good. It's nice and verbable, right? You know, hey, baseline your PO and make, or you know, send me your PO and make sure it's baselined. Um, you know, our, 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 is your general ledger baseline with my general ledger? So then my credit is definitely your debit, you know, that sort of thing. Um, and so it was the right word. 
but before we called it the magic bus and the, no the notion was simply that yeah there's this always on bulletin board that you could put key value pairs on you know again this is very wonky you know distributed system stuff any set of state machines and you know sap oracle uh, you know, uh, you know, any blockchain, also the state machine, any state machine that needs to work with another state machine needs a common frame of reference. You can either make one the primary and the other second secondary, or you can set up some kind of middleware, uh, some enterprise service bus or what have you. And usually what's involved there is you've got, you know, you, you, you have a bulletin board and you put a post-it note with a topic on it and you put a value with it, or you use the topic to say, go look up this value. And that's effectively what baselining is doing is saying, hey, we've, we're, 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 we're using zero knowledge and some other things to make it look like noise. But if you and I shared the location and the secret of a particular piece of uh, a string of uh, nonsense, we know that we both have the same piece of information in our respective traditional systems of record. We know that we are using the same business logic for it. And we know that um, we can go in, look that up as a key and look up in our, in our respective databases and find the, the input values we need for the next step in the workflow. So that's why we call it a message bus. But I think um, actually to, to credit, um, uh, you know, there, there are people like um, uh, Car Karthik Sulper and, uh, and Sam and, and Lucas and folks on both the EY and consensus teams that actually invented some of the really important um, components that made that actually work. So at a high level, it makes sense, but then you had to make it work. Excellent. I, I really appreciate that. So um, I want to come back to Joe. Uh, I think that the best, the best statement I learned ever in my life about change management actually came from a Dilbert cartoon. Uh, and he says, change is good. You go first. And uh, so consensus, you guys uh, have seen a lot of change. You've tried to drive a lot of change. Talk to me about how consensus is changing now because you are changing and where you see consensus going in the future? Um, well, we do like to go first. Uh, consensus started uh, essentially to continue the, uh, the vision and the mission of the Ethereum project. Uh, uh, we configured ourselves to, as I said before, uh, foster adoption, educate, um, and we brought in a whole bunch of entrepreneurs and technologists to try to figure out how to build decentralized applications, figure out what's, what tooling's required, what infrastructure's required. Um, and uh, essentially we had to explore the solution space and had to play our role in opening up a, a brand new ecosystem. Uh, and so uh, we did that, I believe, reasonably effectively and um, I've heard that uh, even the big four are, are now interested in, in being part of the, the blockchain ecosystem. Uh, and so uh, there's a lot of competition um, in our ecosystem now as, uh, as sort of the, the web uh, and the internet uh, become increasingly decentralized. Uh, it's going to come upon us very quickly, I believe. I, I think uh, COVID-19 is going to be an interesting inflection point in in what it does to legacy ways of doing things and what it uh, uh, enables and uh, essentially demands um, in terms of uh, doing things in more decentralized, more robust, more anti-fragile ways. Uh, and so uh, in the last couple of years, uh, we've started to look more into becoming a sort of normal software company. Uh, we started as a venture production studio where lots of our projects uh, had the potential to spin out. Um, and you know, there were teams that worked collaboratively with one another, but didn't share a, say, uh, a single um, overarching goal uh, as a company often does. And so uh, right now we are a software company that uh, has a core tech stack um, consisting of uh, elements at the protocol level, infrastructure level, uh, developer tooling, uh, and quite a bit at the application layer. So it's our, our Hyperledger Basu client, it's Infura, it's MetaMask, it's Codify bringing a whole bunch of um, sort of applications in payments and assets and staking and uh, document management, et cetera. Uh, and this uh, stack is effectively serving as a backbone for what we're thinking of as a blockchain operating system. Uh, so where a blockchain, where an operating system enables uh, you to operate the resources of your computer, a blockchain operating system is going to enable us all to operate our own 
uh, organizations resources and the resources of collaboration networks, whether they're private collaboration networks or um, the public collaboration network or private networks attached in different ways to the public network. So are we really headed for re-decentralization of the web or is the, the power of the existing big companies there secure? How will, this trend, how will disruption happen? Is it going to be legacy companies getting disrupted or is it going to be new business industries being built? What are we going to see most of and first? I think it's all about uh, enabling people to uh, obtain greater agency, greater economic agency, greater political agency. Um, so uh, as we we're still building now for developers and for um, early adopters. Uh, DeFi now, decentralized finance is starting to speak to not just uh, crypto nerds, but uh, financial nerds. Um, and, and soon uh, as we work out uh, the interfaces and make it uh, easier for normal people to understand um, zero interest rates and negative interest rates uh, in the uh, legacy world are just going to look terrible compared to 4% or 8% for uh, different kinds of assets uh, in the emerging decentralized economy. And so um, as we get greater control of our identity and personal information uh, by building tools so like decentralized IDs and, and uh, verifiable credentials that our Uport team has pioneered and there are other others in the world who uh, are building the same uh, and those standards or those products will conform to standards that make them interoperable. Um, people are going to be in control of their assets. People are going to be able to issue their own assets. People are going to be uh, lending and borrowing on peer-to-peer -peer platforms, trading on uh, different kinds of decentralized asset platforms. Um, and these assets are going to be intrinsic uh, to the utility and governance of collaboration networks. Uh, and so uh, we're starting to build decentralized systems that are going to link up to one another, uh, just like uh, internets uh, link up to other internets to create one great big internet. And so um, the governance of whether it's a game network or a supply chain um, track and trace network or a trade finance network or uh, provisioning network, um, all of these systems uh, will uh, likely link into one another either early on through some lateral connectivity, but uh, eventually down into uh, the magic bus, uh, the middleware, as, uh, as John often likes to call it, that uh, uh, is the Ethereum platform, um, and enable us to have personal, economic, political agency and the governance will be much more granular. So instead of us relying on two parties in some major nations or one party in some other major nations to um, uh, propose and affect policy that leaves most people um, wanting, uh, we'll be able to uh, create collaboration networks. Uh, we can spin them up, they can uh, define their agendas, they can fund their agendas and they can execute their agendas. And so uh, the governance in those kinds of systems will be very gra granular. And uh, I think that's gonna serve a lot more people uh, better. Fantastic, thank you so much. Now uh, we are gonna get some questions from the audience, but first I've got one more question for uh, Mr. Wolpert, which is, uh, John, you have done an amazing job of kind of recruiting the DeFi ecosystem into the baseline protocol uh, uh, team. Talk to us about where is the ecosystem around baseline and uh, uh, you know, what, what do all these participants see as the value proposition of joining in? Well, it, it's, it's astounding. I think we broke our part of the internet uh, when we announced it. And this, these are real numbers and we, I didn't double check because I couldn't believe them. Um, but when we, we did a single announcement a single uh, uh, you know, press release at, on, on uh, March 4th. And uh, we got 1.2 billion in reach on that with uh, I think 11 million in advertising equivalency, hundreds of articles generated. And from that, within weeks, we had a GitHub repo that was, was hundreds of people were starring and following and forking. And, and um, it's funny, we, I think almost we're, we're, we have accelerated the, the, the motion towards a single standards um, operation when it comes to Ethereum wide and, or mainnet, if you, if you will. Um, you know, I, I like to say, I like to say mainnet mainly because I wanna 
say that there, there ought to be an inter, inter, and the internet needs a main net and Ethereum in my point of view is a good candidate for the job, but you should define the job and then define the candidate. And, um, ETH, and certainly ETH2 looks like a good candidate. So we need a main net. And um, what's amazing is not, it, it, there are two groups of, of, of parties. There's what we used to call enterprise. And I think the, the joke was, you know, crypto anarchists. I think Joe actually asked me when I moved from IBM, he said, you want to join these crypto anarchists? And I said, well, I was a startup guy for a long time, so I'm, I'm okay with that. But I don't think it is um, enterprises and anarchists. I think it's innovators and improvers or adopters or what, ha what have you. Um, enterprise adopts and improves um, uh, businesses, small and large, and um, all, the, all the innovators out there in the, in the theory community. And they're coming together, so we need really a single standard. Um, I, I, but what's astounding is that behind the scenes, not the, the companies that are showing up in the uh, uh, publicly, like that are putting out their press releases, but the huge companies that are forking and getting quietly involved in baselining, getting quiet briefings that, they, and they're like, don't tell anybody we're interested in the mainnet. We can't, we can't be known. So I think that we're about to see this final breaking through where if you're a C-level executive, you don't have to threaten, your, your career is not threatened by saying blockchain or by saying mainnet. Um, I would like, Paul, if you, if you don't mind, I don't know if I can share the screen, but there, I think people should know the, the, few, the, th the, the, the things that they should be thinking about in terms of whether or not they should be using baselining as an approach to a problem. Is that okay? Yeah, I think you can, you can go ahead and share your screen. That would be great. Uh, and, and if you have any trouble, we'll, we'll see if we can unlock that. Oh, looks like it's working fine. Right. So, you know, the bet, oops, you know, the, the, the way we think of baseline is, you know, speeding adoption of public Ethereum and mainnet by in, in ways that um, make the problems that you, that real are real with public and private blockchain irrelevant and solve, you know, business process automation in the process. So, you know, you want to, um, the problems are data locality, data privacy, data compartmentalization, um, strategic leaks, the benefits are um, those are those are not issues. You have flexible integrations with no silos. You have discrete workflow confidentiality step to step, and you can do this all pay as you go with low TCO. And what you want to be looking for if you're a, if you're in the use case business there, if you're in the, you know doing real things with real people, you want to say, do I have a business process automation issue between multiple partners as a primary requirement? Are a lot of those S, uh, partners SMEs or do they do low volumes with me that would, would make it hard to just to warrant setting up um, enterprise service bus between us because those are expensive? Um, does it reduce upfront co project capital expense? Is that a, an attractive thing? Um, you know, can, do you want to trade CapEx for OpEx? And then uh, most primary partners maintain traditional systems of record like SAP, Oracle, and, and, and what have you. And do they want to not get rid of that? And then I'll, I'll leave the other ones except for this big one, which is not all partners should have access to or even awareness of every step in the workflow. And this is the, the recurring theme that you've been bringing up again and again and, and really helping push into the design of, of baseline, which is the compartmentalization requirements so that you can have complex collaboration that is compartmentalized, but still mathematically provably integrated. That's right. So that if you're using a shipper that you also happen to compete with, you can get the delivery date without them knowing who you are because they can drop that on that magic bus and you can pick that date up and, and, and have a verified date for your invoice without exposing everything you're doing with your customers or your volumes or things that they shouldn't know about. It's a good one of, one of many examples. I guess the last one is that, and I think this is interesting from a EY perspective, if you can have a standards body uh, or a re regulator or somebody that's a, that, that's a verifying gap or a FASB or what have you, um, you can say, you can write a, a library of zero knowledge circuits in such a way that if the counterparties are conducting business through those circuits using the baseline approach um, and, and using a company like, I mean, like, like you know, Duncan's team, for example, uh, Ian Wise, you know, masterful at this stuff to say, hey, we need a library of standards so that we don't have to uh, give some people so much trouble in terms of uh, um, audit or, or, or verification. Um, that's a real opportunity. So you could see a you know whole industry saying, "Yep, do things through this set of circuits, this library, and and you're going to be compliant, and we're going to have to spend less time figuring that out." 
Fantastic. So, uh, John, uh, do we have questions from the audience? John Frechet, I should say. Yep. Uh, so we've got a lot of good questions, Paul. One of them that um, came in recently, but I think John partially just answered is, what kind of Oracle technologies will be used to connect uh, smart contracts in the mainnet with a real world data in traditional systems? I don't know if you want to expand on that. Uh, I'm going to, I'm going to, Mr. Wolpert, I'm going to give that one to you, please. Um, I th there's two kinds of data. One, um, and there are two participants in the in the in 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 baseline in the community that are uh, doing so much work. I should probably mention them. One is uh, Unibright, where they're they're a system integrator with you know where they you know do integrations with companies like SAP and blockchain. And so you need to be able to get data and move it between um, you, know, d you know these traditional systems of record. So you need messaging. And we do need a, 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 you know, a strong messaging protocol. We're looking at a number of options, including even Corda flows. So you can imagine, you know, putting Corda flows into Ethereum or NATS or something like that. So there's um, data, just traditional straight up. I have some data and the only other people that should have that data are my immediate counterparties. And then there's also, you know, deterministically being able to generate data um, or th for workflow steps where you need to have you, you need to be sure you have the same, you can't just do a time lookup without creating non-determinism. Um, so in that case, you could use something like Chainlink and, uh, and other Oracle systems. Uh, Joe might have some thoughts on that. Oh, Nate. John, any more questions, Wolfert? Uh, sorry, uh, Prashet. Uh, yes, yep, we've got another one that says, um, what efforts are being taken to try to educate companies and governments on the benefits and use cases of by using the mainnet, and I'll add outside of this webinar. And and I think uh, Joe, you were uh, recently you were in that Davos pre uh, pre COVID crisis, uh, so you're obviously at the front lines of that. Yeah, so we've been working with uh, with government and uh, um, governmental like bodies for a very long time, um, central banks, uh, you know, especially included. Um, we um, have run the European Union Blockchain Observatory uh, for a couple of years where uh, we've been uh, interacting with member nations and um, writing white papers and driving thought leadership. We work with uh, um, different governments around the world, including the American government. Uh, it's a little bit early still with the American government. Uh, it's uh, uh, mostly in the formative stages of uh, what uh, America's response should be to this technology and, and how they might get behind it. Um, but uh, we're, we're all over the map with respect to uh, still uh, attempting to uh, foster uh, adoption and educate. Fantastic. Uh, John Wolpert, a closing comment before you, before we wrap from you, before we wrap up for the day, I want to give you the last word. Oh boy. Um, I think I've dispatched no all pressure, my pressure, by the way. Um, no, I, I think like I've said, uh, you know, it's been a really amazingly harmonious relationship. You know, I've never seen, and I've spent 30 years knitting companies of, or, and governments and other organizations that, you know, were legally separate together. I don't know why I committed some kind of sin in a past life. It's a hard job. Uh, but this one has been by all, you know, all rights, you know, getting a large group of humans together like this has been, uh, you know, unusually uh, pleasant and harmonious. Um, I, I would say that, uh, um, you know, people should go to docs.baseline-protocol.org. Um, that's going to be where you, you can learn the most, the fastest, um, and then get right into the, get the repo. Um, and uh, if you want to become a member or if you want to um, uh, get on the, the, the steering committee and that sort of thing, there's lots of opportunity for that. And uh, I hope lots of, um, of our enterprise friends and otherwise uh, join. Can, can I just steal a couple words, Paul? Yes, you can. Uh, so, so I've been watching your activities for a very long time. You've been one of the most genius and eloquent uh, um, promoters of decentralized protocol technologies in some of the most difficult places in the world to do that. Uh, first, uh, on the ADEPT project, uh, uh, building an intelligent washing machine uh, on proof of concept version 0 0.5, I, I think, uh, on Ethereum and uh, uh, using a few other technologies uh, on that project and uh, then moving into another um, powerful legacy organization and uh, showing them what 
uh, the potential is. And so um, congratulations for the brilliant work and thank you. Thank you very much. I want to thank my guests, John Wolpert and Joseph Lubin. Uh, and uh, John, uh, John Frechette, if you would bring up our closing slide, that would be terrific. Gentlemen, thank you both for joining. Uh, and what I want to do now is, is just uh, throw out a couple of thank yous. Uh, first of all, I want to thank the EY partners around the world. EY is a partnership, and that means each and every one of us is, uh, uh, each and every one of us who's a partner is contributing to making this work. And uh, the funding, the support, the, 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 the capabilities that we've received from my fellow partners have just been truly, truly, truly amazing. Um, I want to thank again our client and industry guest speakers, Megan Birnett, Mary Lassidy, Joe Lubin, Robert Opp, Rodrigo Santibanez, Alain Catherine Sanas, Suzanne Somerville, Gianluca Tesselin, George Stockmorton, and John Wolpert. Um, the EY Blockchain Marketing and Communications team, Marikit, Lindsay, Kaylin, and Barbara, just amazing work. I talked about them at the beginning, and same for our operations team, Eli, John, Mahir, and Sue Raj. I also want to thank a gentleman in New York named Kevin Crowdle, who gave me a crash course in not sounding terrible or looking terrible online. Uh, it mostly failed, but not completely. And uh, finally, a, a closed out thank you, um, uh, first of all, also to our, our two guest commentators, uh, David and Travis. And finally, JT Nichol and the Ethereum finance community. Uh, we could not be more grateful for the support and the insight. Tomorrow, the most exciting part, audit and finance. But before we get into audit and fintech tomorrow and tax, we're kicking off with the CEO of Italy's national news agency, who is going to be talking about uh, using blockchain to fight fake news. And tomorrow afternoon, we are closing up with Bob Bench from the Federal Reserve. So we have another incredible uh, set of meetings tomorrow. And again, thank you all so much for joining. Have a terrific afternoon, evening, or if you're in Asia Pacific, middle of the night.